So this morning, a look at historical reliability, historical reliability. Is the Bible we have today an accurate copy of the original? How many of you have wondered if the Bible we have today is an accurate translation of what the original authors wrote? Anybody ever? Yeah. You've got to wonder that, don't you? Do you think that the Bible has been accurately preserved? Over 2,000 years of copying and translating. Do you think that what we have today is accurate? How accurate is it? And for those who have not looked into the historical reliability of the biblical text, I'm sure it will strike you with amazement when you see how accurately the Bible has been preserved. What I do find even more amazing is the general consensus of people in our culture who have never studied the Bible or the issue of historical reliability, yet have concluded that what we have today has been significantly altered through time compared to the original text. I've had numerous conversations with co-workers and friends and friends at the gym about this. And one buddy of mine said, we don't even know what the disciples really believed because the Bible has been changed over the years. Hmm. Another friend of mine said, each time it was passed down, there were mistakes. So we don't know what the original said. We can't trust the Bible is an accurate copy. And when I hear people say this, it drives me crazy because it's obvious they have not looked into the subject but have settled on an opinion. It is obvious that they have not looked into the subject because the vast number of early manuscripts that exist today, it's huge. We are looking at the issue of whether or not we have an accurate and reliable copy of the first writings. That's the issue we're looking at today. Has their writing been accurately preserved? If so, how do we know this? So what would be the best way to go about answering that question? Hmm? If you wanted to know, if you have an accurate copy of an original but don't have the original, how could you know whether or not you have an accurate copy? Hmm? Well, the first thing is to gather all the copies available and compare them. And if they all differ wildly, then the chances of accurately deducing the original are far less, right? Virtually impossible. Now, if all the copies agree, then the chances are they are accurate copies. And one can conclude with great certainty what the original said. Now, the more copies we have to compare, greater is our accuracy of determining what the original said. The more copies we have to compare, the better chances we can be sure we have an accurate copy. Now, after comparing all the copies, and during this comparison, one would take into account the date of the copy. If the copies that were written closest to the date of the original differ greatly from the copies written much later from the original, our confidence in what we have today is eroded. The percentage of accuracy goes down. But if the text of the later copies agrees with the early copies, our confidence in the text goes up as the accuracy goes up. Now, an interesting point about textual mistakes they can actually serve to increase the accuracy of the text rather than diminish it. For example, common mistakes are made, which tells us with great accuracy what it was supposed to say. Scribes had common or typical copying patterns, including mistakes. Therefore, some of the variants in the text are easily deduced which tells us with great certainty what the original said. More on textual variants in a bit. So in order to determine what the original said, we need as many copies as we can get. The more, the better. And we must date the copies, the earlier, the better. 
And we must compare the copies we have through time to map out patterns and variant copying patterns. The more the better. This process is applied to all historical texts to determine their accuracy. It's pretty much common sense, right? Right? It's pretty much common sense, the process. But this process of scrutiny is part of a theological discipline called apologetics. Remember apologetics? It's the religious discipline defending or proving the truths of religious doctrines through systematic argumentation and discourse. I took apologetics in university and during my master's degree studies. And what I loved about apologetics was how it always asked the hard questions. No question was taboo. You could ask anything. And part of the discipline was to look at every argument aimed at discrediting the text or religion. Then list the responses and then scrutinize those responses. It was a very systematic approach. Now, without getting into the details and vastness of the apologetic discipline, let us come back to the aspect of Christian apologetics we are dealing with today, which is the historical reliability of the biblical text. So let's apply the process of textual scrutiny to the New Testament of the Bible and then compare it to other historical texts. So, currently, in museums and churches around the world, there are ancient copies of the Bible. Physical ancient manuscripts that we have that we can look at today. These copies are in the original language, which was Koine Greek. They are copied from Koine Greek to Koine Greek. And part of determining the date of ancient writings includes the examination of the material they were written on. So you look at the language, you look at the writing style, and you look at the material that it was written on. Now, the oldest manuscripts were written on papyrus, a material that was prepared in ancient Egypt from the stem of a water plant. And it was used in sheets throughout the ancient Mediterranean world for writing and for painting on, also for making rope and sandals and boats. It was very durable. Now, another material used at the time when they were writing the Bible to write on was vellum, which was calf skin. Most of the scrolls were written on papyrus, and most of the codex was typically written using vellum. You know what a codex is? This, this is the codex. That, that's, a, that's a major invention in history. We, we just think it's a typical book. But typically, if you, you look at a book, I can go directly to the end of a book. I can go to the middle of a book, you know, quickly. But with the scroll, I have to scroll through the whole thing to get to the beginning, the middle, and the end. So codex became very, very popular. And uh, they tended to write most codices on vellum, sheets of calfskin. All of the ancient Greek manuscripts of the New Testament are categorized, categorized according to the material they are written on and the literary style. So the earliest of these manuscripts was written on papyrus. Now, part of the old styles includes something called uncials. Uncials are Greek manuscripts written in all capital letters. Then you also have a writing style called minuscules. Minuscules is written in all small letters, similar to our cursive style that we use today. And then the final category of these Greek manuscripts is the lectionary manuscripts. And these are copies of text used for seasonal festivals, events, ceremonies, used for memorization. So those are the three writing styles, four writing styles that are written on papyrus and vellum. Now, how many of these Greek manuscripts do we have to compare to each other? Five? Fifty? A thousand? Five thousand? Right? Remember exploring a few minutes ago? You're in trouble if you don't. <laughs> there are 5,641 Koine Greek manuscripts. What? Isn't that amazing? Hmm. 
we have an incredible pool of material to compare. Altogether, there are 76 papyri manuscripts, 306 uncials, the capital letter written ones, 2,856 minuscules. We have 2,403 lectionaries for a total of 5,641 Greek manuscripts. Now, these are all manuscripts that we have today. Some of these manuscripts date as far back as the first century. So here are a few of them that I would like to highlight. One of them, the oldest one to date so far, uh, is called the John Ryland's Papyri. It dates back to A.D. 117, yet some scholars, many scholars actually, date it even earlier. Next to that is the Magdalene Papyri. It dates back to 200, but again, a lot of scholars believe it dates back between 40 and 70 A.D., the Bodmer Papyri contains the Gospel of John and Luke along with Jude, 1st and 2nd Peter. It's dated around 200 AD. The Codex Vaticanus, a vellum manuscript, contains the whole New Testament as well as the Septuagint. You know what the Septuagint is? It is a Greek translation of the Old Testament. Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Uh, Koine Greek became the common language, so they translated from the Hebrew into the Greek, and that's called the Septuagint. That, uh, that particular um, translation, the Codex Vaticanus, dates to 325 AD. That's the, the Codex, the calfskin book. The Codex Sinaiticus, 340 A.D. The Codex Ephraim, Rescriptus, 350 A.D. Codex Alexandrius, 450 A.D. That's a lot of manuscripts, isn't it? Hmm, we have a lot to compare. Norman Geisler, in his book called Christian Apologetics, points out that Although these vellum manuscripts date from the 4th and 5th centuries, they represent in whole or in part an Alexandrian-type text that dates from A.D. 100 to 150. What he's saying is these are copies of copies that go way back, right back to the 1st century. And beyond the Greek manuscripts, we also have translations with which comparisons can be made. Very early manuscripts in Latin, Syriac, Coptic, Armenian, Gothic, Georgian, Ethiopic. There is a great variety of translated copies that are also available for comparison. Now, these ancient translations are very powerful tools for determining the originals because they confirm an understanding of the text during the translation process. These texts reveal not only the original text, but how that original text was understood. And by comparing translations, one can deduce the common source material as well as a common understanding and set of beliefs held by the early church. Now, altogether, we have approximately 24,000 manuscripts, 24,000 manuscripts in existence that we can use to confirm the accuracy of our copy to the original. Does that sound impressive? It should. <laughs> it should. Not only do we have these ancient manuscripts to compare to each other, but we also have tons of extra-biblical material which contains quotes from the text, such as commentaries, sermons, and letters. And we have so much of this extra material, Bruce Metzger, New Testament scholar, says that we could still reproduce the contents of the New Testament from the multiplicity of quotations in commentaries, sermons, letters, and so forth of the early church fathers. So we have our original Greek manuscripts, we have our translations, and then we have all the people writing about the Bible in commentary, sermons, and letters. All of this to confirm and compare with each other. What do you do with all this material? You compare it. <laughs> That's exactly what we do with it all. 
We compare it for accuracy. Does it all agree? Where does it disagree? Do the disagreements change any major beliefs or foundational doctrines of the Christian church? So first of all, how much do all these manuscripts differ from one another? Hmm? How much do they differ? The New Testament has about 20,000 lines in it. About 40 are in doubt. And what that means is there are 40 lines that we can't be 100% sure that that's what the original said. That gives us an accuracy rate of over 99.5%. 99.5%? Now think about it. We're comparing how many documents? 24,000! Somebody's listening. 24,000 documents yielding a 99.5% accuracy rate? Do you think that anything was lost in translation? Do you think anything was lost during the copying? That's incredible. It's amazing, really. And if you ever want to see what the variants between the Greek manuscripts are, then you can. Do you want to see them? They're right here. I have brought with me my Greek New Testament, which lists all of the variants at the bottom of each page. So this Greek edition is a conglomeration of all the Greek texts. So this is the 5,641 collection right here. And at the bottom of each page, if there's a variant, it lists which manuscript says what at the bottom of each page. So this isn't guesswork, right? And I also have it here in Hebrew, the Biblia Hebraica. It's the same thing, comparing all of the Hebrew manuscripts. So I'll pass these around. You can browse these. So please be gentle with them. Uh, the pages are, uh, are kind of flimsy on them, uh, so be gentle. But you can take a look at that, and you can see at the bottom of each page how it compares them all. So if you're ever, ever in doubt on what the Bible actually says, well, you can check it for yourself. It's amazing scholarship. Now, keep in mind, those variants at the bottom of the page, even if a period is missing, it is listed in the variants at the bottom of the page. If a letter or half a letter is missing or added, it is listed at the bottom of the page. Everything, everything has been meticulously scrutinized. Investigative journalist Lee Strobel asked New Testament scholar Bruce Metzger in an interview, he asked, how many doctrines of the church are in jeopardy because of variance? I don't know of any doctrine that is in jeopardy, Bruce Metzger responded. None. This tells us that the scribes and copyists were not manipulating the text through time to suit their beliefs or traditions. This gives us an incredibly accurate window into that period of history. So, let's compare the Bible to other ancient texts. Here's a chart comparing some of the most famous ancient texts. And we have a few of them listed there. So we have the author, when it was written, the earliest copy we have, the time span uh, between the author and the earliest copy, and then the number of copies that we have. So let's take a brief look at this chart. First, we have Caesar, which was written between 144 BC. The earliest copy we have is AD 900. It's like 800 years later, right? Well, time span of a thousand years. And the number of copies we have are 10. How about Plato? Everybody's you know, uh, familiar with Plato? Plato's writings, 427 to 347 BC. The earliest copy, again, is 900 AD. That's 1,200 years after Plato. How many copies do we have? Seven. 
It's amazing how many people quote Plato, right? Hmm. How about, well, Livy is, is a Roman historian. Uh, let's look at him just below Caesar, 59 BC to 80, 17. We don't know when the earliest copies are, so we can't tell what the time span is, but we have 20 copies of it. It's quite ambiguous, isn't it? Uh, what about uh, Tacitus? Uh, his Histories of Rome, 8100 uh, was when it was written, AD 1100, a thousand year time span with 20 copies. Uh, Pliny the Younger, 61 to 113 AD, 850 years. Time span is 750 years from the time he wrote it to the first copy, seven copies. And as you go down, you can see them. Take a look at Aristotle, 384 to 322 BC, close to the bottom there. And the earliest copy is AD 1100. 1400 year span. And we have about 49 copies to compare that to. It's not a lot, is it? Uh, Homer, you look at, he was written 900 BC. Earliest copper copy is 400 BC, a 500 year period between when he wrote it and the first copy. And there are 643 copies. Well, that seems impressive now, doesn't it? Until you look at the New Testament. The New Testament was written between 50 and 100 AD. The earliest copy that we have is 125 AD. The time span is 25 years. And the number of copies is over 24,000. We have another chart, very similar one. Um, this, this one is actually not from the American Journal of Biblical Theology. I, I, didn't, I didn't change that. Uh, this is actually from Norman Geisler's book, Christian Apologetics. And what he has in there is, he has a few extra things that are undetermined, right? Is the accuracy of the copies, which cannot be, be determined because there isn't enough material. And the source material doesn't go back close enough to the author. Uh, if you look at, for example, the, Mah the Mahabharata, that's an Indian religious text, uh, it is undetermined when it was written, when they have the earliest copy, they don't know how many copies they actually have of this because they can't confirm any of them. And uh, so they have about a 90% accuracy rate of what they have today, which they aren't sure is accurate, right? But then if you look at Homer's, that was the, uh, on the previous slide, it had the lots of copies, right? See there, Homer there, um, 643 copies. Now if we go back to our next slide, 643 copies yields a 95% accuracy rate. But look at the time in between Homer and the first copy. Back to the first slide again. So you're looking at 400 years before you have the first copy. And then you only have uh, 643 copies that you compare, right? Yep. Now compare that to the New Testament. Date written the first century, right? 50 to 100. Earliest copies of the second century there. Number of copies are 5,000. The next most reliable ancient documents are Homer. Between 643 copies and 5,000? Right? That's not including all of the extra translations. That's just the Greek manuscripts. For an accuracy rate of the Bible, 99.5%. How many knew that the Bible was that accurate? No idea. Isn't that amazing? So the next time one of your friends at the gym says... The Bible <laughs> has been copied so many times, you don't know what the original says. <laughs> That's what you get for going to the gym, right? Drives me crazy when I hear people say that. Oh, there's so much evidence. Norman Geisler, he points out in his book, Christian Apologetics. There is more abundant and accurate manuscript evidence for the New Testament than for any other book from the ancient world. He goes on to say, Most books do not survive with enough manuscripts that make comparison possible. 
a handful of copies that are 1,000 years after the fact, do not provide enough links in the missing chain, nor enough variant readings in the manuscript to enable textual scholars to reconstruct the original. Frederick Kenyon, in the Paleography of Greek Papyri, says, In no other case is the interval of time between the composition of the book and the date of the earliest manuscripts so short as in that of the New Testament. Gary Habermas, in the Historical Jesus, Ancient Evidence for the Life of Christ, notes, The New Testament has better evidence than any other ancient book. None of the canonical New Testament is lost or missing. By comparison, 107 of Livy's 142 books of history have been lost, and about one half of Tacitus's 30 books of Annals and Histories is missing. Livy and Tacitus are Roman historians. Furthermore, the Gospels, the letters of the New Testament, these were not written years after the events themselves. They were written by eyewitnesses and those who were in contact with the eyewitnesses to the events. Copies of the writings of these events fall within one generation of when they were written. Gary Habermas points out, each of the Gospels was either written by an eyewitness or significantly influenced by first-hand testimony. Bruce Metzger says this means that the New Testament records are authentic first-century and first-hand information about the life, teachings, death, and resurrection of Christ. Now, there are some fantastic books about the historical reliability of the Bible and the Christian message. Now, some of my recommendations are The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. How many have read that book? Nobody has read that book? <laughs> How dare you have not read that book? I'm, I'm shocked. I'm shocked that nobody has read that book. It's, it is a fantastic, it, it's a, it, wow, I don't know what to say. Um, that's your homework. <laughs> the Case for Christ, written by Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel is an investigative journalist. Who applied, who applies his trade to scrutinize the historical claims of Christianity. They actually just made a movie about his book. Um, a little bit of background of Lee Strobel. He uncovered the, uh, the Ford Pinto story. Do you remember the Ford Pinto story? The car? <laughs> oh. And people wonder why we do so much history here in our church. Uh, Lee Strobel was the investigative journalist who uncovered the Ford Pinto, where Ford built that little subcompact car. And there is documented evidence of the engineers who cut corners so that when the car is hit from behind at 20 kilometers an hour or more, it explodes and bursts into flames. Right? But they built the car anyway to save money. And then there was, it's the, it's the largest automotive class action lawsuit against Ford. It's this guy who uncovered that story. You were right, yeah, Ford Pinto. <clears throat> Don't drive a Ford Pinto. <laughs> so this investigative journalist, his wife, I'll give you this, the, the, the short version of the story, his wife becomes a Christian. He's atheist slash agnostic. And so he goes out to prove how ridiculous her belief is and ends up becoming a Christian himself. So he writes a book about this because he goes out to disprove the historical reliability of the Bible. It's a very well-written book. Um, it's fantastic. He interviews uh, biblical scholars like Bruce Metzger, uh, Wilkins, Morlins, Gary Habermas, etc., and so on. So I, I highly recommend you. That's a great book to start with. Um, it's, it's a wonderful book. So I highly recommend that. The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. There, I can't wait to see the movie. I'm really looking forward to it. Now, on the academic side, I highly recommend the book, uh, The Historical Jesus, Ancient Evidence for the Life of Christ by Gary Habermas. 
Also, Christian Apologetics by Norman Geisler, uh, Jesus Under Fire, which has a number of academic articles compiled together uh, with general editors uh, Michael Wilkins and J.P. Moreland. These are all famous uh, ancient manuscript scholars. Now, contained within the bibliographies of these books are countless other books and papers written on this subject. But you know something? Here's the thing. One may not like what is written in the New Testament. One may disagree with what Jesus and the New Testament writers taught. But one cannot argue with the fact that this is what Jesus and the disciples and the early church said, taught, and did. With such an abundance of evidence, we can approach the biblical text with confidence and assurance. We may not like the message it contains. We may find it difficult to apply to our lives, but we cannot doubt the words it contains. Knowing that we can trust the reliability of the word historically, may we move to a place of trusting the wisdom contained in the words and apply it to our lives. Have you ever wondered why the Bible has been so accurately preserved compared to other ancient texts? I believe it's because the people who did apply the wisdom behind the teaching experienced such incredible things, things that we can read in the text itself. And they were compelled, inspired, to write it down that others may experience the same thing. It is with wonder that we can look at the historical reliability of the text and its wonderful experience waiting for those who apply that historical text to their lives. Amen.